Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I hope you are having a wonderful end of your week and that your weekend is looking good. As you may or may not know, I am also one of the hosts on the Pet Podcast. I only do this one once a week, and we have three other great hosts. If you haven't listened to the Pet Podcast, maybe you might want to if you're a fan of animals. I thought, though, that I would do something a little bit different today and uh, do some some cross-promotion with the Pets Podcast. Uh, since I do host a book review podcast and I host a pets podcast, I thought, hmm, books and pets, pets and books, what can I do with that? <laughs> well, obviously, books throughout history are littered with animals and pets, and uh, we may not remember them once the book is done, or we may have a strong connection to them in some way. They may play a large role in the book. Or they may kind of be a secondary character. They may be, you know, if it's a fantasy book, they might be speaking animals. <laughs> and they could have even bigger parts than they would in in a, a regular book where they're just non-speaking animals. So I thought that I would talk about some of the pets and animals in books that I remember throughout my life. A lot of these will be children's books, but um, maybe not all. We'll just see where my brain takes me for the next little while. The first animal that came to mind when I started thinking about this was the dog, Jack, in Little House on the Prairie. Little House in the Big Woods and then Little House on the Prairie, I think, into on the banks of Plum Creek. I don't remember exactly when they lost Jack. Oh, I do. I do. It was... Um, it was after on the banks of Plum Creek in that transition period before they moved again and he had just mentioned that Jack had died. Anyway, what fascinated me as a child about Jack, uh, the brindle bulldog I think he was, is first of all I didn't know what brindled meant as a small child. <laughs> Um, whatever. But the fact that when they moved the first time from their little house in the big woods to their little house on the prairie in Kansas somewhere, probably Kansas territory at any rate, uh, they took the horse, horses and wagon and they went there. But, uh, Jack went with them and Jack walked the whole time. And I just remember thinking, Oh, poor Jack. Everyone else gets to ride in the wagon. Why does Jack have to walk? And isn't that an awfully long way for a poor dog to have to walk? Seriously, they can't just pick him up and put him in the wagon every once in a while. Um, I was very upset for poor Jack. <laughs> you know, is he getting enough water? Is he getting enough food? How sore are his little paws? Um, so uh, that was my main concern for Jack. And then in the rest of the book, you know, he's 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 there, but I I don't remember having too many reactions to him. Uh, you know, was he a good guard dog? Was he a good companion? I don't really remember, but I just remember that he had to walk, and I felt bad for this this poor little fictional, possibly fictionalized dog, depending on you know whether or not he actually existed or existed in the way that he did in real life in the books, since we all know that those are fictionalized versions of Laura Ingalls' life, like Laura Ingalls Wilder's life. Um, still, that's my that's my impression of Jack the Brindle Bulldog. They also get a cat later in the series. I believe it's after Pa has the dream that he's getting a haircut and he wakes up and there's like there's a mouse nibbling off pieces of his hair and he throws it against the wall and it makes a splat and then they get a mouse because or they get a, a, a mouse or they get a cat. But I don't even know if the cat had a name. Maybe they just called it Kitty. 
um, and it certainly didn't have much of a role and it didn't have to walk across states so, or territories. So I don't have as much of a, as much of a connection with the cat in, um, the Little House series at any rate. Another dog who isn't a pet and who would be very, very offended if I called him a pet. I know he's fictional. Shush. Uh, I have relationships with my, with fictional characters all the time and talk to them in my head. Uh, this is from a series by Terry Brooks. It is not his Shannara series. Instead, it is ma- it's his Magical Kingdom for Sale series. And you encounter a character once the main character of the book, Ben, goes to the other world, the magical world, this magical world of Landover that he buys out of essentially a Sears catalog kind of thing. And you are introduced to a variety of characters, one of whom is Abernathy, who is a, um, what is he? He is a Wheaton Terrier. That's what he is. But he used to be human. Um, he's, uh, one of the advisors in this, in the, the king's court. He is the court scribe. He is, becomes one of Ben's good friends. And the wizard in the court, Questor Thews, uh, turned Abernathy into a Wheaton Terrier. This was prior to Ben Holiday's arrival in Landover. Uh, he turned him into a Wheaton Terrier to escape the cruelties of the old king's son, but unfortunately then did not possess enough magical knowledge to reverse the spell and return Abernathy to his human form. Um, Abernathy does not let Quester forget this throughout the series. And um, Quester keeps trying and trying to return Abernathy to um, human form. He unfortunately is... um. He, he's a dog, but he still has, uh, I think he still has human hands or human aspects to his hands. He walks upright like a human. He dresses in clothes. He wears glasses. Um, and I just thought, I always thought that was an interesting uh, take on it. And I really liked, I like him as a character. He's got an interesting relationship with Quester. They're friends, but, you know, they have that bickering thing going on because they've been together so long through so many different um, ups and downs. And then, of course, the whole turning him into a dog thing that, that can put a crimp in anybody's relationship. Um, but he, I, I just, I just liked him. He's funny. He is, he's funny in a different way. Quester Thews is funny in kind of this, uh, outlandish, always screwing up magic sort of way. Quester is, or Abernathy is just kind of like, rawr, 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 rawr. <laughs> and, um, he does at one point become human again, briefly, and I can't remember the circumstances, but it doesn't last. And he is, as I said, not a pet. He would be offended if I called him a pet and that he would have every right to do so. He does even at one point in one of the books, there are six books in this series. At one book point, he ends up in Ben's world, which is what we would think of as our world as, you know, on earth or are they all on earth? It's just a different realm. I'm not, uh, I'm not entirely sure. Parallel universes, something. Uh, so he, anyway, he ends up in this world and he makes friends with a, a young human girl who notices that he's not quite a dog. Oh, and by the way, he talks, <laughs> which is not common in our world. So there's the adventure of trying to maintain his the illusion that he is an actual dog and not a man turned dog i loved abernathy so much i started reading these books in junior high or high school maybe can't remember exactly when probably around freshman year so right around that junior high high school time i liked him so much that uh, my first boyfriend my only boyfriend in high school doesn't matter uh my boyfriend in high school gave me um a little white teddy bear for my birthday and i named him abernathy yep i still have abernathy somewhere uh no i know where he is yes i do okay i agree i, I agree i don't even know what i'm agreeing to but abernathy is one of my favorite characters and i love the name just kind of rolls off the tongue, Abernathy. <laughs> and so I named a teddy bear after him, which would have been more appropriate if it was a stuffed doggy, but whatever. I'm not always exactly literal, even though I can frequently be quite literal. 
Let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we will be switching to uh, dogs or cats or I don't know, maybe we'll get some reptiles in there uh, from other books in my life. So stay tuned and we will be right back. You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. Pets bring such joy to our lives, and the GSMC Pets Podcast is here to share in that joy. We'll tell stories of pets finding their forever homes, acting in unexpected ways, being helpful, or just being silly. Whether you love dogs, cats, llamas, reptiles, fish, or you've never met an animal you didn't like, the GSMC Pets Podcast is for you. Before the break, I was talking about the character of Abernathy in the Magic Kingdom for the Magic Kingdom of Landover series. I always call it the name of the first book is Magic Kingdom for Sale Sold. So I always call it the Magic Kingdom series, but it's really the Magic Kingdom of Landover series, if you want to be precise. And now we are moving on to some other books with animals and or pets in them. One thing that I've never really liked through my whole life is books about animals specifically uh, let's let's see no um it, things like old yeller um or where the red fern grows or books like that where the animal always dies never liked that um, my sister my sister to this day won't even watch a movie that has animal that is the story of an animal because she's always convinced that the animal is going to die and uh you know i i never got really into the black the black stallion series i just wasn't into those kinds of animal books if it was an animal that maybe from the the animal's perspective were kind of fun and silly great but um the more serious ones and just just was never my my cup of tea and i i didn't actually have pets growing up i didn't care for dogs growing up um I, my mom says that I would climb her like a jungle gym when there I was around dogs for a very long time um, during my my youth. So definitely that has definitely changed now. But I still liked reading about animals, and I, um, I I had my series of favorites. So now I want to move on to an author that I loved growing up, and that is E. B. White. Um, you know what? I wonder what EB stands for. I don't know that I've ever looked for it. It's the Elwin. His name was Elwin. 
What is his full name? Elwyn Brooks White. I did not know that. Okay. Elwyn Brooks, E.B. White. You probably know him as the author of the book Charlotte's Web. He might be most famous for that one. He also, I just saw when I looked up his, what his initials stood for, uh, is in 1970 won the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award, which is cool because, you know, we just talked about her in the first segment. What is the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award, you may ask? Well, I can tell you. It's actually the Children's Literature Legacy Award. Also, it was known as the Laura Ingalls Wilder Medal until 2018, and he won it in 1970. So it is a prize awarded by the Association for Library Service to Children, ALSC, which is a division of the American Library Association. It's given to writers or illustrators of children's books published in the United States who have, over a period of years, made substantial and lasting contributions to children's literature. The Bronze Medal Prize was named after its first win winner, who was then Laura Ingalls Wilder. Okay, so E.B. White, he wrote... Charlotte's Web, which I loved growing up, but it also made me sad. One of those books, I mean, Charlotte works so hard and she she gets Wilbur a reprieve, but then sadness and then Wilbur's sad and everybody's sad. It's like I'm, it's like I'm not trying to give you any spoilers. Charlotte dies. It's been out for a really long time. <laughs> so hopefully I didn't just ruin it for you, but only after she gives birth to lots and lots and lots of spider babies that then uh, a couple of whom stick close and become Wilbur's friends. So he's not friendless, but it was sad. At any rate, the other two books of E.B. White's that I loved growing up were Stuart Little and uh, maybe you have read that one, or maybe you've seen the movie of it. It is illustrated by Garth Williams, who also illustrated the Little House books. I don't know if this is a theme here, but uh, I didn't mean it to be. Uh, Stuart Little was um, is, a, is a realistic fantasy about a mouse-like human boy named Stuart Little. According to the first chapter, he looked very much like a rat-slash-mouse in every way. Uh, so... E.B. White described how he came to conceive of Stuart Little. He said, Many years ago, I went to bed on w one night in a railway sleeping car, and during the night, I dreamed about a tiny boy who acted rather like a rat. That's how the story of Stuart Little got started. He had the dream in the spring of 1926 while sleeping on a train on his way back to New York from a visit to the Shenandoah Valley. Biographer Michael Sims wrote that Stuart arrived in White's mind in a direct shipment from the subconscious. Um, White typed up a few stories about Stuart, which he told to his 18 nieces and nephews when they asked him to tell him a story. In 1935, White's wife, Catherine, showed these stories to Clarence Day, then a regular contributor to The New Yorker. Day liked the stories and encouraged White not to neglect them, but neither Oxford University Press nor Viking Press was interested in the stories, and White did not immediately develop them further. Um, so there is a little bit of background on it. And this is, this is the, the story of Stuart Little. He's a mouse born into the Little family. And they just, they treat him like a, a, well, a tiny little person looking like a mouse. You may have seen the movie, which was adapted into a film in 1999. It's been that long. Jeez. Um, one difference in the, from the film and the book is that Stuart is adopted instead of born into the family. Um, and then there was a 2002 sequel to the first film, which was Stuart Little Book, and that more closely follows the plot of the book. And then a third film, Stuart Little 3, Call of the Wild, was released, released direct to video in 2006. So I didn't, I don't think I saw Stuart Little 2 or Stuart Little 3, but I saw the first one and it was okay. Uh, I, but I loved the book growing up and the, the idea of this, this little tiny mouse boy who was born into this family and just did, you know, boy slash mouse things. It was very cute. And again, Stuart is not really a pet. I mean, he's a boy, he's son, mouse combo, whatever you would call him. Another book by E.B. White that I loved is The Trumpet of the Swan. And this one was written in 1970. Um, it tells the story of Louis, um, uh, which is a reference to Louis Armstrong that is made explicit in the book. Uh, Louis is a trumpeter swan 
born without a voice who come, overcomes this difficult by learning to play a trumpet to impress a beautiful swan named Serena. In Canada, during the spring of 1968, the cob and the pen, uh, the, the cob is the name for an adult male swan, and the pen, the name for an adult female swan, both trumpeter swans build their summer nest on a small island in a pond. The swans are worried when Sam Beaver, an 11-year-old boy on a camping trip with his father, begins coming to the lake every day to watch them. The cob believes that human boys are dangerous. One day, while the pen steps away from her eggs to stretch her legs, a fox slips up behind her. Sam chases the fox away, saving both the female and her eggs. After this incident, the swans begin to trust him. After the hatching of their cygnets, the cob proudly leads his brood to Sam to introduce them. The cygnets each chirp at Sam in greeting, except for the youngest, who is named Louis and is unable to chirp, but pulls Sam's shoelace instead. The adult swans gradually realize that Louis is mute. The adults grow increasingly concerned about Louis, worrying that he will not be able to find a mate if he cannot trumpet like all the other swans. Louis's father promises to find a way for him to communicate. At the end of the summer, the Swan family flies to their winter refuge, Red Rock Lakes in Montana. Probably another reason why I liked the book. <laughs> Louis decides he should learn to read and write in order to communicate and flies away from the refuge to visit Sam Beaver. Sam takes his swan friend to school with him the next morning. Louis turns out to be a natural at reading and writing, and Sam buys him a portable blackboard and chalk so he can communicate. Unfortunately, because the other swans cannot read, Louis is still lonely. Okay, you get where I'm going with this. You know, eventually he learns how to play a trumpet, and I think part of me just loved the idea of A, a swan who could read and love to read and hung out with his, his friend and who taught him to read and gave him a chalkboard, and B, the idea of a swan playing a trumpet, because A, swans have no lips, and B, their wings don't actually work as arms regardless of what animation would have you believe. Yeah, again, Louie, not a pet, more of a friend, but this was one of my absolute favorite books growing up. I read it multiple times, and now I am feeling all nostalgic and thinking that I need to go back and read it again. Let's go ahead and take our second break of the podcast, and when we come back, we will be switching to Harry Potter. 8 million trillion different pe different pets in that story so stay tuned we'll be right back you really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product whether it's a logo a website a book cover or an ad campaign you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market that's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. 
from news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network, guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to this episode on books and pets and pets and books and animals and all sorts of fun things. There are just oodles of examples of pets in books, and I wonder what your favorites are. I would love to hear, so hit me up in the comments, please, or in on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You could even share pictures on Instagram of those favorite pets. Love to see that. Uh, I said before the break, um, when we were talking about E.B. White, love E.B. White, that we would switch now to Harry Potter, and there are so many pets to love in Harry Potter. I mean, where do you even start? First of all, Hedwig, beautiful, tragic, oh, tore my heart out uh, in book seven. Hedwig is Harry's first real friend. She is given to him by Hagrid for his um birthday before he goes to Hogwarts. He he chooses her and then he finds her name in a book. And Hedwig is his constant companion. She's often his only friend during the summer months when he is stuck at the Dursleys. She has definite personality, mostly in that she's very affectionate unless she's mad at Harry and then she lets it be known that she is mad at him and she nips him and she turns his, her back on him and she's like hmm. um, she's not a talking animal she doesn't have any kind of powers she's just a very sweet white uh, snowy owl and she is Harry's friend and she is a wonderful and amazing companion as so many pets are and I often wonder though um, because they're together all summer and then Harry goes back to Hogwarts and he goes to his dorm room and and Hedwig goes to the owlery unless she's delivering him some mail and I know he goes and visits her and stuff but how often do they really see each other does Hedwig like that arrangement does she like that she gets to go up to the owlery with other owls am I thinking too much about a fictional owl maybe it's okay another uh well there's another pet that is a pet but not a pet and that is um Scabbers who's actually Peter Pettigrew and Scabbers is 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 kind of an interesting rat while well, he is a rat and you know you're like oh he's he's kind of pathetic and that's his main the main point of scabbers is that he's kind of pathetic although he did once bite goyle for them and that that was nice but then it gets creepy <laughs> and as ron said i let you sleep in my bed yes ron that is definitely a good point because yikes no icky turns out that uh scabbers is a animagus who or peter pettigrew is an animagus so that is someone that can turn into an animal so ron's pet was really just a dude turning himself who turned himself into a rat for 15 years or something i can't remember the length of time um many many years to hide himself for what he did in the part of uh, harry's parents getting killed um and that's just all kinds of creepy all kinds of creepy but ron does get a replacement pet it is a little tiny owl named pigwig <laughs> and just this little fluffy ball of fluff uh, is how i picture it so that's ron and harry hermione has a cat named crookshanks who's always described as having like a smashed in kind of face a ginger cat with sort of a smashed in face and crookshanks is your typical cat you know she's cranky um opinionated but she is the only one who sees scabbers for what he actually is which causes a lot of friction between ron and hermione because uh hermione i mean crookshanks keeps trying to attack scabbers we find out later that it's for good reason but Hermione loves her kitty fiercely and defends him to the end even though he is a 
apparently kind of ugly and um, a bit of a pain in the tush, as cats often can be. Oh, so many pets in, um, so many pets. Errol, the Weasley's owl, who's just old and falls asleep a lot and kind of crashes into windows. Poor Errol. Uh, Fang, Hagrid's dog Fang, who is a ginormous kind of wimpy boarhound. <laughs> I love Fang. He drools a lot. Um, what else? Well, Fluffy, if you want to count Fluffy. Uh, I mean, if you want to talk Hagrid pets, we could probably do an hour long podcast on just that or a couple hours. Norbert, the baby dragon. So many different pets in Harry Potter and I love it because they are, they're such a, they're such a fun, I mean, they're such a kind of small part of the story as a whole, but you get to know them a little bit, you know, you get to know the stories of Hedwig and Crookshanks and Fang and, um, Trevor. Oh, how can we forget Trevor? Neville's frog Trevor, who I don't know if he just is wanting to explore the world or if he doesn't want to be a pet or if he doesn't like Neville. I don't know. He's always escaping and Trevor never, Neville can never find Trevor. Constantly looking for Trevor. Um, poor Neville. I love Neville. At any rate, Harry Potter is a treasure trove of pets and animals uh you get you get the exotic animals i mean obviously fluffy is a three-headed dog um uh, just uh, norbert is a baby dragon who grows up to be oh norberta a female a female dragon actually but who grows up to be an adult dragon so many many different i guess you could count um oh goodness hippogriff they call him Wither Wings. Buckwheat. Buck, but, no, Buckbeak. Sorry, <laughs> Buckbeak. Who, uh, kind of becomes at least a companion, if not a pet, too serious later in the series. And then he goes back to Hagrid. Um, so, you know, that's a grip, that's a, um, a hippogriff. Uh, so definitely on the more exotic, fantastic side. And then, of course, there's the book Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them which then became a movie. Oh, I do kind of want a Niffler. No, I mean, I don't want a Niffler because they seem pretty destructive, but they're stinking cute. <laughs> they're like little fluffy platypuses. I don't know. Fluffy seems to be my word of the day. Okay, let's go ahead and take another break before I say the word fluffy again. But it's the name of a three-headed dog. I have to say it sometime. Break time. See you soon. Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. Time to hashtag everything. We talk about all the fun, crazy stories on social media. From Instagram to Facebook, Twitter to Tumblr, or probably even Friendster. Join us each week as we explore the quirky side of social media. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. It's simple, it's simple, such a sad song. The one that... Welcome back. We are talking about pets or animals in books. There are millions of them. I can't even begin to cover them all. You're probably sitting there listening to the podcast screaming, yes, but what about from this book? It was my favorite. And you're probably right. I mean, who knows? Uh, a couple more that just popped into my head during the break. I've talked before on the Booker You podcast about um, the fudge and super fudge series and <laughs> the turtle that the big brother has in that series that gets swallowed by fudge. But then he does get a dog named turtle. But as a kid, I always, I, I always loved that turtle. <laughs> Even though he met a really horrible, horrible end. Um, wow. The kid swallowed a turtle, but he does get a dog. Peter is very happy. Uh, that's the big brother, and he names the dog Turtle in in uh, mem in memory of his former his former original pet. Um, 
I love those books. They just crack me up. I think I've also talked before about the book Socks by Beverly Cleary uh, about a cat. And I always felt bad for the cat because the family had a baby and then the, the cat felt neglected and put upon and like they were ignoring the cat and being mean to the cat and not, the cat wasn't getting enough attention. It all works out in the end. But I, I did... I did read that book and feel sad from the perspective of a cat. Another book by Beverly Cleary that I forgot about is Ribsy, and that is, um, that's about Henry Huggins' dog, who he becomes separated from his owner, Henry, in a shopping center parking lot. Um, so he begins a string of bewildering adventures. To find out what those adventures are, you will have to uh, then read the books. I've also spoken about the Mrs. Piggle Wiggle books, and Mrs. Piggle Wiggle, in, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle's farm was one of my favorites. I, I'm still not entirely sure why she suddenly had a farm when she always lived in that little upside down house in the middle of town, but then she has a farm. Um, but one thing that she has, one, one pet that she has that is helpful and is with her in even her upside down house is Lester the pig. And Lester the pig helps teach children manners. <laughs> You may not, you may not think it, but Lester is very, very polite. And so he, he, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle loans him to the family and he comes in and teaches, teaches children about, you know, being polite and minding their manners and not slurping their food and just, you know, all these wonderful things because he is a very, very polite pig. Uh, Wilbur and Charlotte's Web may be some pig, but Lester is quite the polite pig himself. As I'm sure you can imagine, there is a, um, Goodreads, that's the word I'm looking for, Goodreads list for just about everything, and this is no exception. There is a Goodreads list for 156, I think they say, best p- fictional pets, and many of the ones that we are have already talked about are in here, Charlotte's Web, Harry Potter, another one that came up, um... A lot in my reading was, uh, the, w- were the dire wolves in Game of Thrones, um, especially Ghost. And I, I've watched parts of Game of Thrones and I've never read the books because holy words, Batman, um, I just have not quite gotten into them. The Golden Compass, that's another one that we could talk about that has, are they pets? They're not quite pets because they are, yeah, kind of part of the people. So I wouldn't necessarily call those pets, but definitely a lot of different animals in those. Um, then Dewey, the small town library cat who touched the world. I love books about library cats. I would read anything that had a library cat in it. In fact, my father, as I've said, is the, was the librarian when I was growing up at the school and there were, there were posters in the library of library cats. It's probably where my love of library cats came from. I don't know. I'm allergic to cats. It's not like I can actually have one. <laughs> I'm just scrolling through the list now uh, to see if there are any others that we haven't covered or that we are jumping out at me. The Hunger Games. Why is this on here? Help me out, people. What pets should I be thinking about in The Hunger Games? I'm not even sure. Uh, let's see. Um, many books that have been made into movies, like A Dog's Purpose and the something Secret of Racing in the Rain. Is that what it's called? Um, can't remember if that's the perfectly correct title, but, uh, now we're going through and I'm just not seeing anything that is really jumping out at me. Uh, Black Stallion, of course, again, not one of my personal favorites, but I was just never really a horse person. Probably because my mother is allergic. I'm also allergic, but not as allergic as she is. So, yeah. Um, oh, the art of purring. That's sweet. Oh, the Dalai Lama's cat. Huh. Interesting. Uh, oh, the Dalai Lama's cat has many books. Uh, the Dalai Lama's cat and the power of meow. That's the number three. <laughs> he. I like it. Uh, there's some Christmas books. Always good. Ooh, I should think about pets in Christmas books for uh, next holiday season. Okay, so you get the point. Um, I'm sure that there are a million that I just cannot think of off the top of my head and you can think of and you should definitely tell me about those books and what your favorite fictional pets are because... 
it's fun. I I love pets, and you know we haven't even we haven't even touched on uh, dragons. Uh, yeah, I might have to do a separate dragon episode because just think of all the dragons there are from Toothless, who's really a really a very bad pet if you read the books. He's nothing like Toothless in the uh, in the movies. He's quite quite mischievous and um, difficult. Yeah, that's probably the easiest way of describing him. Oh, before I go, I just thought of one more, and that is Mr. Popper's Penguins. I know they made it into a movie. I wasn't so thrilled with the movie, but have you read Mr. Popper's Penguins? Oh my gosh, it was my favorite growing up. I, I, I loved it, and it was written, let's see, um, 1938 was when it was originally published and it was written by Richard and Florence Atwater with illustrations by Robert Lawson. It tells the story of a poor house painter named Mr. Popper and his family who live in the small town of Stillwater in the 1930s. So of course, 1930s, you know, you've got the depression going on. Um, the Poppers unexpectedly come into possession of a penguin, Captain Cook. The Poppers then receive a female penguin from the zoo who mates with Captain Cook to have ten baby penguins. Before long, something must be done lest the penguins eat the Poppers out of house and home. Um, <laughs> I loved this book. I thought it was so fun. Just imagining raising a family of penguins. And even as a kid, I was like, but don't penguins live where it's cold? And, they, you know, they, they have ways of dealing with that. But eventually, uh, Mr. Popper begins to raise money by training the 12 penguins and turning them into a circus act. Um, and then Mr. Popper's performing penguins are featured throughout the country. And then they start to cause trouble as penguins, of course, always do. I don't know if they always do, but um, <laughs> it's an adventure. It's a penguin adventure. And I love those little penguins. I love that book. Again, another one that I'm going to have to reread from my childhood. Oh, there's so many books that I either haven't read or I want to reread. So many books. So very little time. I think I'm going to wrap this up because I could either go on and on and on and ramble and ramble or, well, I could. Not I think. We all know I could. Let's go ahead and wrap this up, though. If you are a fan of this podcast, please do like us and follow us and retweet us and share us on all those wonderful things on social media, Facebook and in, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also, um, review the podcast if you like it and would like to help us out. Um, written reviews are great. Five star reviews are awesome. We love them and we love you, our listeners and giving us reviews really, really helps us to get this podcast out to more people like yourself. So I hope that you have a great weekend, um, rest of your weekend, and that that weekend involves some time to get yourself lost in a good book about pets. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.